My job is to watch bird watchers. <laughs> and you can learn a lot by observing them. For example, how to be patient and stay still. Because sometimes they have to wait several hours for the right moment to capture the perfect picture. How to pay attention to details? Because they have some identification skills to identify birds based on their size, color, and behavior. Interestingly, they must be very good listeners because sometimes they recognize birds by hearing their songs. You also can learn from them how to organize and plan because they have to plan for their trips to find the best location and decide on the best time of observation. They also know how to share their knowledge and experience with other members of their club because they have clubs and online forums to share their experiences. Tonight, I am here to share my experience and my story of how I became a watcher of bird watchers. <laughs> Ten years ago, I read a book written by Lars Svensson, a Norwegian philosopher, about the essence of work. What is work? What is not work? What is the role of work in shaping our personal and social identity? He has a number of books about fundamental aspects of life, like philosophy of freedom, fear, loneliness, lying. I read the book, and it was fascinating, and I learned a lot. But the more I reflected on the meaning of work, the more I realized we can't understand the essence of work without understanding the other side of this coin, which is leisure. So I had new questions. What is leisure? What is the difference between passive entertainment for pure pleasure and active engagement in hobbies and voluntary activities for a meaningful and joyful purpose? While reflecting on these questions and exploring the literature, leisure literature, I came across a fascinating concept. Serious leisure. If this is a new term for you, serious leisure, leisure, which looks like an oxymoron with a paradoxical nature, includes hobbies, voluntary activities, and amateurism. Activities which are sufficiently challenging but adequately rewarding. You need to learn some skills. You need to dedicate time and effort. So, in serious leisure, after a while, it will be part of your identity, and it has the capacity to turn into a career, like bonsai growing, pottery, carpentry, woodworking. In serious leisure, you might just observe things and appreciate the beauty, like photography or bird watching. You might collect things, like stamp collecting, coin collecting, book collecting. You may create things like carpentry, cooking, gardening. You may repair things like restoring classic cars or furniture. Or you may perform like dancing, singing, or various kinds of sports. But the main point is, you engage in the activity because you love it. For example, if you are playing a music instrument, you love the act of playing. So six years ago, I started a number of projects about various kinds of serious leisure, and I interviewed people from 
uh, different hobbies and voluntary activities. And I collected the data, I analyzed the data, and I identified a number of categories. But the most visible one was belongingness. Having a sense of belonging. Even in solo hobbies or solitary hobbies, when you can perform the activity alone, like bonsai growing or knitting, there is always a social aspect of that. For example, when I asked bonsai growers, what is your advice to people who are interested in this hobby, they told me, join a club. Because they learned their skills from other members of the club. Or let's return to bird watching. How does bird watching manifest belongingness? They have a deep connection with nature. That's the first sign of belongingness. They know how to create communities of interest, clubs, online forums. They have a sense of place. They return to the place they have good memories. So what is belongingness? Why is it so important? Belongingness is one of the most fundamental needs of human being. That's why Abraham Maslow, in his famous hierarchy of needs, the theory of hierarchy of needs, put belongingness right after physiological needs and safety. That's why belongingness is so important. We all need to be part of a group to be accepted, respected, and valued. Whether it's family, friends, work, leisure, or sports. So, belongingness is everywhere. If I, in, if I ask you who are you, if I invite you to introduce yourself, whatever your answer would be to this question is a form of belongingness. Your parents, your family, your education, your career, your nationality, your culture, it's all belongingness. So belongingness shapes our identity, dignity, and integrity. In South African philosophy, there is a concept called Ubuntu. Ubuntu means I am because you are, because we are. I need you to be myself. You need me to be yourself. We need each other. It doesn't matter if we believe it or not. It works like a law of physics because of the interconnected nature of reality. So when I looked at other cultures, I found similar terms. For example, in Japanese culture, there is a concept called ibasho. Ibasho refers to a space or place, safe place, when you can be truly yourself because you are not worried to be judged. You can be as authentic as you are. It's all about friendship. It's all about respect. You can ask for help and you can offer help. And when I reflect on, on my own culture, Iranian culture and Persian literature, which is, by the way, one of my main serious pleasure activities, I understand why 800 years ago, our great poet, Saadiya Shirazi, said, Bani Adam azai yek digarand, ke dar afarinesh ze yek goharand. It means human beings are member of a whole, in the creation of one essence and soul. Thank you.